System Program Office, uh, which is based at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in Paris, and I'll moderate today. And for the next hour, we'll start with a 30-minute presentation from Libby Jewett of NOAA, where she's director of the Ocean Certification Program. And the talk is on an update of the Go On for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network and planned activities. So after the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. Um, I'll moderate and select and ask questions verbally, but you can already start typing your questions into the chat window that you'll see in the lower right-hand corner of your window. And I'll try to select questions that are representative, and we'll try to attempt this, uh, to answer as many questions as time permits. Um, so please uh, know that this session is being recorded, and the link will be posted on the Goose webpage. Libby is speaking to us today from NOAA in Washington, D.C. So Libby, I'll hand it over to you for the presentation. Yeah, I also want to thank all of my um, U.S. colleagues who uh, are probably up pretty early this morning. So thank you. And we're headed into the holiday weekend, so it's even more of a commitment that you've made. So first of all, um, so yes, I am Libby Jewett. And I'm at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Washington, D.C., and I'm director of uh, NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. Uh, before I get started, I do want to thank um, Albert Fisher and Forrest Collins and others for, from the Global Ocean Observing System um, office for inviting me to speak here today. And um, in the webinar, I plan to give an overview of the Global OA Observing Network. Um, what drove its creation, and how it's being developed, and where we are headed. So without further ado, um, I'm actually not going to be presenting a lot of science today, but I figured since we are talking about ocean acidification, we better get everyone on the same page about what we mean by that. So um, ocean acidification is a phenomenon that is driven by rising levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, as so, this uh, particular slide is um, pulled from the IPCC AR5 report, and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And so, um, in the top um, graphic, you're seeing rising CO2 levels in the atmosphere over time, um, and then the middle one, we're actually seeing as CO2 goes up in the atmosphere. Um, a reduction in pH over time in our surface waters around the globe. And even below that, we're seeing a reduction in the availability of the carbonate ion. And so just to reiterate, um, carbon dioxide is an acid gas. Uh, and so as it goes in the atmosphere, it's actually naturally through diffusion taken up by the ocean. And uh, CO2 combines with water forms carbonic acid. Um, it's a weak acid, which throws off hydrogen ions, thus the increase in hydrogen ions, or increase in acidity, or decrease in pH um, of our surface waters. And this is, I'm going to go into some of the more complicated aspects of this shortly, but that's just a, a short refresher on um, the changes that we're seeing. And, and this information is quite well documented um, in the recent AR5 IPCC report. So um, we like to use um, this term that uh, OA is a global condition. It's obviously affecting oceans around the world. But where the rubber hits the road is that um, uh, uh, we're trying to figure out you know, what the effects are going to be for uh, people who live in places, therefore um, you know, trying to figure out the local effects of, um, of ocean acidification around the world. So um, as we know, marine ecosystems and people um, tend to hug our coasts. And one of the intents of this Global OA Observing Network is to build something that not only is documenting um, the global change, but is also trying to drill down and figure out what the local ramifications are going to be. And so along those lines, uh, one thing I like to note is that as we get closer to our coasts, the chemistry gets more complicated. And I think over time, uh, since this large OA effort, global effort, has 
evolved, we're actually getting a better understanding of what happens. But um, as you approach the coast, the chemistry is complicated by inputs from land. And as you see on this graphic, on the left, we talk about river inputs. Uh, we also talk about all of the biological activities um, that happen along the coast. Uh, we have coral reefs along the coast. We have algal blooms along the coast. That's where fish live. And so um, as you talk about you know, river inputs, you're also talking about nutrient inputs, which spur a lot of those activities. And all of this can have ramifications for um, the carbon system and the distribution of um, the different uh, carbon species. So, uh, and an uh, important thing to note about that is that, you know, as I said, CO2 goes in the water, combines with water, and creates carbonic acid. Um, but it also, you know, we're seeing an increase in bicarbonate ions, increase in hydrogen ions, decrease in um, carbonate ions, and um, a decrease in alkalinity. And so, um, between all of those uh, factors, any one of those can have ramifications for the biology. So I just wanted to note that this is um, uh, more complicated than just an effect on, on pH levels. So it's our conviction, and this is a graphic that I'll come back to, um, it's our conviction that uh, we need to look you know, from the global scale to the local scale. This is a um, map that you can find on our website, and I'm going to bring this the web URL up a few times because I'm hoping uh, that you all will take the time to look at this uh, incredible website that we've put together. But um, that we, you know, it's our conviction that we need to monitor OA and its impacts from the global to the local level. And so now I'm going to um, segue into the, the creation of the Global OA Observing Network. Um, and then we'll and talk about how we're interacting with the global ocean observing system in that process. So uh, the, the Global OA Network is really a, 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 a child of many activities that were unfolding, um, you know, starting in, you know, 05, 06 and up till the present. And so this is a graphic that you can actually find in the, in the plan that we've put together. And so, you know, a combination of, um, you know, GOOS putting together its framework for ocean observing, and the GOOS work with the International Ocean Carbon Coordination Project, in addition to the, the Ocean Ob Symposium um, that happened in 2009 that had a number of important papers on ocean acidification, in addition to the Solus Imber um, creating an OA working group, and then the creation also of the International Coordination Center on Ocean Acidification in 2012, all of those things, all of those entities kind of were, were together combining to create this, um, this push, this interest in creating some sort of ocean acidification observing network. And then in addition, um, the NOAA OA program came to being in 2011. And uh, we were able to put the resources together to hold the first of the, of the two international workshops that we've held. So the first one was held at the University of Washington um, in June 2012. We had about 62 participants from 23 countries. And then shortly thereafter, in 2013, we had the second workshop um, in St. Andrews, uh, Scotland, and was attended by 87 participants from 26 countries. And now we can say we have scientists from over 30 countries participating in the network. So we're, we're growing. Um, and But beyond that sort of initial group that I was talking about, GOOS and IOCCP um, and IOC doing a lot of that sort of initial work, um, this, is, this is our you know, graphic showing uh, the the organizational support structure, because we're very much intent on not creating something that's not leveraging everything that we can possibly leverage that's already out there. And to the focal point, the, the core um, graphic in the middle is to say, you know, the network wouldn't be possible without the work of the important work of our scientists and the important funding that comes from our 
national funding sources that are supporting those, those scientists. But in addition, as, as noted before, we have the IOCCP, IOC, Hughes, um, GEO, IAEA, the OAICC, and then a whole, you know, even other sort of peripheral groups that are supporting our work and we're, we're leveraging all of that. And, and I encourage you, if there, if there are other groups that we don't have represented per, currently in this graphic, but you think need to be at the table, um, you know, I encourage you to bring that forward to us, uh, you know, soon. So um, this is this is to show the that our uh, evolution process is um, quite uh, parallel to the process that has been going on in the framework for ocean observing, the process put together by the Global Ocean Observing System, and. Um, so like use our process started with the establishment of societal or scientific requirements for observing and monitoring. And, and much of this has happened within our workshops, but also inside conversations and in those preliminary documents that were put together for Ocean Ops 09. And so starting with those scientific requirements, then developing strategy for implementation, that's kind of you know what we're doing now. Um, we've been trying to broker international agreements and, you know, leverage, again, with other groups and other countries. Um, but, but actually, in that brokering international agreements on measurement standards and procedures, I'd say that we're really relying on the Global Ocean Observing System and its panels that are putting together the essential ocean variables and the require, measurement requirements for those across platforms, I think we'll be, we will be relying on on Hughes to establish those more specific requirements. And if you had a chance to read our plan, you know, what we laid out there is a little more general. Uh, we're, we're working on data quality control procedures, um, but also working through Hughes to do that. We're thinking about data synthesis products, which I'll talk about in a second. And then, um, you know, obviously working with our stakeholder community um, as well. And again, this is just to reiterate that we feel that the, the real importance of creating this global OA observing network is that we want to provide data that goes down to the local level, um, that's being collected at the local level, but integrated you know, at the country level and then at the regional level and then to the international level. And much of what we have now is data that's being collected in international waters but you know the intention is that we will get all the way to our coast because that's where a lot of the blank spots are when we try and look at the global picture. So so far the OA community has defined the rationale, design, and locations of components for an international certification observing network, um, very much taking into account existing activities. Um, we've defined a minimum suite of measurement parameters. Um, uh, basic strategy for data quality assurance and data distribution and again they are very much relying on what the carbon community um, has done over the past decades. I know that they've been wrestling with the data quality aspects um, and making sure that people are measuring things in the same way um, and that the metadata is um, very ample. Uh, and so we, we want to recognize those efforts. Um, we're not trying to create something new. We want to leverage that. And then what the requirements are for international, for international integration. And in the first meeting, we, we came out with our basic three goals for the network. So goal one is to, um, that, it, that the network provide an understanding of the global ocean certification conditions. Um, and this is very much focused on the chemistry. You know, how is the chemistry changing? What are the spatial um, and temporal uh, variability of, of uh, ocean certification? And you know, this chemical part of, is actually also um, has a biological component because, as we know, as biological activity happens. Um, it also affects the chemistry, and so there's there's a little bit of a back and forth there, which I'll go into further. And then goal two is to develop, use, and document, and develop an understanding of the ecosystem response to ocean acidification by 
um, by developing a system for understanding the biological response. And, and we are wrestling with that a little bit right now, and I want to give you some more specifics in a second. And then make sure that the data that we're collecting is um, most useful for modeling, because we're going to need to forecast out where we're headed. And so um, we definitely recognize from the beginning that we're talking about uh, very variable ecosystems that we're, we're, we needed to cover how we're going to how we're going to expand the network um, in open ocean systems from polar to tropical that we're talking about coasts and estuaries that we're getting you know very close to the coast and um, that we need to develop recommendations for coral reef ecosystems. We also, as I said, very much are building on what already exists. So we're uh, knitting together observations from a variety of platforms, um, from ships to moorings to alternative technologies to um, you know, simple bottle collections and, and analysis um, in labs. And when we did our uh, needs assessment on, on what some of the gaps are, of which there are many, if we look at the open ocean coverage, uh, we definitely feel like they are very significant building blocks. Um, but the network definitely needs filling in. If you, if you look at our, the map on our, on our website, you know, you'll see, for instance, the southern Pacific Ocean, that there are a lot of gaps in coverage there. Um, that there's perhaps more coverage in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, et cetera. Um, if you look at our coasts and shelf seas, on the global scale, we definitely need construction. On, again, on the regional level, there are some fairly well-developed systems, uh, but there are many gaps. And then for coral reefs, again, you know, you know, large areas like uh, Western Pacific Ocean Coral Triangle area that very much needs construction, but on the regional scale, some there are some systems that are more developed that we can use to export and those measurement um, technologies to to other regions. So the the um, system design again laid out in our plan is is the nested system. And so we have those goals one, two, and three, and then within those we have um, three levels. And since we haven't been around very long, we're, we've you know really try to focus in on the critical minimum measurements, level one. But we've also laid out some information about what level two measurements might look at like. So measurements for integrated assessment to enhance the interpretation of level one, and then level three. Um, perhaps are more one-off um, activities that are happening in specific regions, but not everywhere. Um, eventually, we might want to implement, but you know, we're not there yet. And then goal two, which are the ecosystem responses, we recognize that there's only a subset of places where those measurements will be happening. And in fact, we're trying to establish what um, of the various parameters that we've identified, which might be the most important ones that we need to focus on. So again, looking at this nested system design, we have our three goals. And, and level one, goal one, level one, um, is ensuring that we constrain the carbonate system. Um, and there are a number of ways that one might do that, depending on where you're doing your measurements. But also, we need to measure temperature, salinity, oxygen. And then, in some cases, if possible, and this gets into the how the biology affects the chemistry, um, measure fluorescence, fluorescence and radiance. And I'll note on the oxygen side um, that the GUES, I believe it's the Biogeochemical Panel, um, recently released their more specific requirements across platforms for. Um, for measuring dissolved oxygen. And so we'll very much be referring to that um, in terms of our goal one level one requirements. And then now I want to um, segue into the bio biological side. So we have goal two, level two, and some very um, basic measurements. So what's included right here in this graphic is 
something that uh, was um, arose across the different kinds of ecosystems as a measurement that we might like to make, that is the biomass and abundance of functional groups in the pelagic um, waters, so phytoplankton, zooplankton, and microbes, although that doesn't give you a whole lot of guidance, so that's why we're still working on this. Um, and so I'll get into the biology in a sec. I do want to say that we have defined two data quality objectives. Um, one is climate data, so I think in our plan we say plus or minus 1% um, estimation of the carbonate ion concentration, so that's the definition of our climate data. So of sufficient and defined quality to assess long-term trends um, with defined level of confidence. And then the, we have another level, which is weather data, and so that's plus or minus 10% um, in the measurement of, or estimation of the or calculation of the carbonate ion concentration. Um, and our, this is important because, you know, we're going to have, especially as the network grows, we're going to have uh, more and more new scientists coming to the, uh, be included in the network, and we wanted to give um, you know, enough leeway there to, for them to be included, and, but even if they couldn't reach the climate level um, level of data. However, we also recognize that this weather data, um, quality weather data, um, is also useful, you know, depending on uh, what the ramifications or impacts um, might be along a particular coast. So we didn't want to throw that out. I think it's, um, in some cases, very useful. In fact, something that we use along um, the U.S. West Coast in our um, adaptation strategies related to our oyster industry. So, and I can go into more details if people have questions about that. So one thing that we have established that's new is we, within the GOAN, is a biological working group, the biology working group, which is headed by Sam DuPont from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And um, this is a fairly tall task, um, but we have, or rather, multiple tasks are involved. And so they've set out, um, and together with the executive committee of the Global OA, Net o Global OA Observing Network, have set out these three tasks, which is one, to ensure that the um, chemical monitoring program is meeting the information needs of biologists. We're trying to look in, in particular areas where we are already doing chemical monitoring to figure out whether that information is, is useful um, to interpret the biological response. Task two is to evaluate the needs and requirements of a biological monitoring program. That's a rather larger task. And actually, we'll, we're hoping that this working group will provide the framework that we can then discuss at our third international go on meeting, which we'll, I'll mention shortly. Uh, and then task three is um, to think about developing a theoretical framework for linking chemical changes to biological response, um, perhaps to um, be able to develop, to map synthesis products um, that may forecast out where biological responses may be seen first. So. Um, I can go into a little more detail if that doesn't make sense. So now I just wanted to sh sort of quickly show some of the um, end member measurements that we came up for the various types of ecosystems in terms of the biological response with the hope that you biologists who may have joined this webinar um, can think about this and, and participate in our discussion. And so um, for polar seas, some of the, um, the basic measurements that, that we see as will be responsive to the chemical changes are phytoplankton and zooplankton biomass and abundance. Again, you know, we haven't given species names or um, specific types of zooplankton, so there's some work to be done there. Um, we have sunlight, phytoplankton functional types, and particulate inorganic carbon as some particularly important things to measure. Um, for tropical seas, again, some of the things what they were grayed out has already been mentioned for another 
type of system, but we also, for tropical seas, will need, or biologists consider it important to measure turbidity, sea dawn, and size fractionated chlorophyll. The temperate seas, again, some of the, the other end members, but also calcified to non calcified plankton abundance. And for nearshore and estuaries, not only phytoplankton and zooplankton, but benthic producers and consumers abundance in biomass, um, total suspended solids and nutrients. And then for coral reefs, uh, again, because there's a much even closer coupling between um, the biology and the chemistry, is in order to interpret the chemistry, we need to understand better the biomass of biota, and that would be corals and coralline algae, other photosynthesizers, um, in addition to changes in net ecosystem processes. And then in terms of looking at how the biology is responding to the chemistry, um, we have to, you know, there are a whole range of potential end members that might be responding, um, all the um, calcifying organisms, um, in addition to the net neck ratio, and then the um, the habitat, you know, looking at um, how the habitat is changing in response. So now, um, just want to, so so <laughs> now that you're thoroughly confused, um, now I, I now that you have more information about what we're doing on the biology, I want to give you some updates about the global network, and then we can move to questions. So. Uh, in the last year, we've established the terms of reference for the Executive Council, and I'm going to show you the names of the folks that are on that council. Um, we do have our website up and running, and in fact, um, we now have a calendar on the website that's new as of this week, so that you can check in there um, for updates on Go On related activities. We are conducting um, regular communications through a quarterly newsletter. And I encourage you to become a member of Go On. That's a very simple thing, and I'll tell you how to do that um, so that you can receive our newsletters, which are just giving broader updates on our activities. In addition, um, the International Coordination Center on OA has sponsored a data management and data portal meeting, which just happened in June. Um, and we, the ICC will also be holding a data synthesis workshop planned for September. And so, um, again, on the data synthesis side, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but I want to say that um, we are looking um, for broader input on what kind of synthesis products the community thinks would be useful. And on the portal side, um, you know, I think something that distinguishes the go on from do's is that we actually have it in our plan or in our intention um, to create a data portal that would uh, provide access to uh, data more readily and easily in compatible formats um, from databases, from data centers around the world. So we're not creating a new data center, we're creating a pool that will feed, that will pull data from the data centers. And another intention or idea um, might be that we to provide even real-time OA data, which is something that we're doing along the U.S. West Coast. And what I'm, this is something um, that you can get to with that URL on the bottom of the slide um, that's been put together by one of our regional associations of IUS called NANUS. Um, they've done a fantastic job with uh, providing a specific portal um, to real-time ocean, uh, ocean acidification information from a number of observing platforms along the West Coast. And so, you know, this is an idea, um, but at the very least, um, you know, kind of a basic framework for, for um, how to think about a portal as we move forward. And so, when you go into our website, you'll see this map of our various ocean acidification assets and but you know that's what this is this is an inventory now of the of the assets that exist and but it's not the data um, but it's important because you know there's information here uh, that you can access and I just wanted to show so if you if you mouse over any one of um, those platforms whether it be a cruise line or um, one of the, the you know, triangles or, or dots, 
um, it, what will pop up is information about who is collecting that um, OA related information, um, uh, if they have a website, where that website is, um, and the types of, um, of parameters that they're collecting on, you know, what time scale. And the, the red are current moored observing assets, the um, triangles are uh, time series stations. Uh, the green are ships of opportunity that have been outfitted with the OA parameter, and the blue are the large repeat hydrography or go ship lines. And so one thing that, again, I want to go back to that idea of data synthesis products, um, something that uh, some of our NOAA colleagues here have been working on is a, a climatology for aragonite saturation state based on um, the larger open ocean uh, data sets, GLODAP and Crenia, and there may be another one involved there. But as you'll know, so this, this actually is um, quite interesting and something's going to be, um, I think it's been already submitted as a manuscript, it's showing aragonite saturation by depth, obviously decreasing by depth, the bluer being lower aragonite saturation state. Um, and so this is the type of mapped product um, that will only be further enhanced um, with the additional measurements that are included in the network. And as you'll note here, because this is mostly based on the large international ship transits, I believe, um, that what you don't see or what you see is uh, whiteouts along the coasts. And yet, again, that's the effects are local. That's where the effects are going to be seen. And so, you know, our intention would be that the global network will be useful for filling out that information um, and you can actually bring uh, a saturation state like map all the way to the coast. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the intention. So in terms of upcoming opportunities uh, where Global OA Network will likely uh, factor into the conversation, um, the U.S. held the first Our Ocean Conference uh, back in June 2014. Um, the next Our Ocean Conference will be held in Chile um, in October 2015. And ocean certification is again going to be one of the central priority themes of that conference. And I am guessing, especially since Chile has been one of the leads in the Latin American region, um, for ocean observing that the Global OA Observing Network will, will be discussed there. And in fact, you know, one important thing that happens at these conferences is that countries make um, announcements about new deliverables related to the themes and um, hopefully we'll be seeing some deliverables announced at this upcoming conference. Secondly, the first, so we have something um, exciting to announce, which is that we have a, um, a group, an affinity group that has raised funds to support the network called the Friends of the Global OA Observing Network. And this Friends of the Global OA Observing Network is um, overseen and, and led by the, the Ocean Foundation, which is based in the U.S. but has sort of international reputation. And as a result of the last Our Ocean Conference, they raised uh, some funds from private foundations, and we are just moving forward on the first of those investments, which is going to be a capacity building workshop along the coast of Mozambique. Um, that will be held in January 2016, led by Sam Dupont again of Sweden. Um, we are hoping that that, in addition to another capacity building workshop led by the ICC of South Africa, um, to see um, broader inclusion of our African colleagues in this ocean certification effort. Um, thirdly, that we're planning for the third Global OA Observing Network scientific meeting. So as I mentioned, we've had two large scientific meetings. Um, for the third one to happen after the next Oceans in a High CO2 World meeting, which is planned for the 3rd to the 6th of May, um, in Hobart, Australia, and so that meeting ends on Friday, and the intention is the Go On Scientific Workshop will start on Monday or Sunday or Monday um, of right after that. 
and and the focus will largely be on this biological observing component. And then finally, I want to say that the U.S. is now chairing the Arctic Council, and uh, one of the initiatives that we've put forward is to to work with our colleagues around the globe to explain, expand global OA observing network, um, expand it in Arctic waters. So, and then some of the future needs, um, we're trying to, again, use the network to expand scientific capacity in underserved regions. We're working very closely with the International Coordination Center and the IAEA to do that. Um, and again, we had that workshop happening in Mozambique coming up. We are um, thinking about, although we haven't necessarily implemented this idea yet, to start developing regional networks. And I think um, as regions, uh, more and more regions become involved, that this is um, going to be likely the way um, the governance of the Go On proceeds. We are thinking about uh, the establishment of Go On Secretariat. Uh, we don't have the funds for that yet, but if we did, um, I think the responsibilities would include managing the data portal, generating these data synthesis products, um, and upkeep of the Go On website, maintaining the membership, overseeing the newsletter, conducting workshops, and just sort of generally moving the effort forward. So if you have any bright ideas on how to make that happen. Um, I just wanted to show you the list of the Go On Executive Council uh, in case you have further questions or you're wondering who from your region might be participating. And so uh, Phil Williamson of the UK and myself are the co-chairs of the council. And then we have um, other science members, Richard Bellaby, Fei Chai, Arthur Chen, Min Han Dai, Sam DuPont, Dick Feely. Um, Kitak Lee, Jeremy Mathis, Pedro Montero, Dan Newton, Benjamin File, Bronson Tilbrook, and then we have represent representational members from these various coordinating entities, so Albert Fisher, David Osborne, Magic Kuchuski, um, Jorge Valdez from IRC, and then Kathy Koska from NOAA is the one overseeing our website, and we have um, support from Kirsten Asensi of the IOC and Lena Hansen. So, um, just wanted people to be know uh, that group. Uh, we do have the uh, you know, hard copies now of the plan. If you're interested in the hard copies. you can get that, although you can also download it from the, our website. Um, I want to thank uh, Jan Newton for all of her hard work on the on plan, making sure that it, um, it actually got finished, uh, which happened this past January, and to the ICC for printing it. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is a screen capture from our website. You can uh, go in and do some interaction with our uh, with our map. Um, you can download the plan. Um, you can look at the list of network members. You can have yourself added to that list. And, and I want to reiterate, we are not a, a governmental organization. We are a network of scientists. You know, whether we eventually morph into something that's governmental, I don't know. But right now, um, you know, the price of membership is just saying that you want to be part of it. And so I just want to end by giving all of you our email contacts. If you're interested in or know of foundations or private donors who want to contribute to the Go On, um, I've given you Mark Spaulding's contact information from the Ocean Foundation. Um, if you're interested in receiving the newsletter and becoming listed on our website as a member, if you can contact Erica Ombre. 
And then um, for the website, um, if you are aware of observing happening in your Thank region, you very much, Libby. And, and let me just start by congratulating you and Phil and all the other members of the network for quite map. a dynamic uh, um, There is a downloadable. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but let me uh, start. Form that you can get off the website, and yeah. that needs to go back to um, the which, uh, which, um, And the more complete and, we have uh, that map as we move into that data portal. Um, Concept side. Yeah, can you hear me better now? The, the more quickly we'll be okay. able to do that if we make sure that that is well. So, um, so on that I just wanted to start with a general question, which is about um, about why we're interested in ocean acidifications, particularly because of its potential impacts on ocean ecosystems. Uh, but ocean ecosystems are also um, subject to different stressors, such as temperature, such as lack of oxygen, nutrients you mentioned at the coast. So when you talk about the second goal of Go On, how do you observe the individual impact of stressors on, on ecosystems, the individual impact of ocean acidification? And what's the role of, of laboratory experiments in supporting that kind of work? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, OA is not happening in a vacuum, um, and I think the the community, especially the biological community, is very much, you know, initially was sort of focused on a single stressor and trying to figure out what the impacts of OA alone were, and has now very much moved towards looking at OA in a multi-stressor uh, context. Um, and I, I mean, I think the feeling of the, the Go On community is that the experimental um, experimental work is critical because we're not going to be, we need to be able to document um, what's happening initially in the lab before we start trying to monitor things in the field. I think people won't really, um, won't believe that we've chosen the right parameters unless we've been able to show some response in a controlled setting. However, you know, obviously we're also going to be measuring temperature and oxygen in addition to the carbonate system um, in the field. And so, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to account for those other stressors as well. In fact, some of the, the biological experimental results that we're seeing now are showing that, you know, when when we do measurements, when we do... Right, well, so that's, that's actually quite an interesting concept that the different stressors don't add linearly and can have uh, interactions with each other. So we have a couple of um, uh, questions, and I, I, I encourage all the participants to please ask questions in the chat. You actually get more than the combined... So let's take uh, Rick Wanikoff's question, um, which is about the formal interactions and agreements between the International Coordination Center, the OAICC sponsored by IAEA, and the IOCC goes in IOC. Take it to a field level. So I don't, I don't know if that is answering the question. All right, well, I, I can't actually. <laughs> All right, well, I'll take a quick stab at it, and you can correct me if, if you have other information. So, so Rick, I think there's no actual formal written um, agreement between the OAICC and any of those bodies that you talked about, IOCCP, GOOSE, or IOC. Um, IOC, UNESCO, and IAEA are both, are both part of a, um, a, a UN coordination activity, so we do coordinate when it comes to any kind of ocean input in the whole UN system. We do keep you know, a conversation the, going. Yeah. So sorry, there's questions. You want to answer it? Okay. 
Yeah, and I, I, yeah, so I was going to say, um, you know, again, the go on, even though it feels like a real thing, is still very much a coordination effort across all of these entities. And in terms of having legal or formal agreements, that hasn't really been how we have operated so far. But um, the the Global Observing Network is a formal project of the OA International Coordination Center. So in that sense, I guess we kind of um, have, an, have an agreement um, yeah. that the, the OA ICC will So Tasta has a specific question about the 2015 activity. October um, um, Chile meeting, or 2016, is it? The sort of goodwill and uh, including, you know, the key people from these other coordination activities on our executive council so that we make sure that we're, um, you know, we're all sharing information. I don't, I don't, does that make sense? Albert, does that resonate? <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, so the, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of details. I believe it's planned, being planned for the first week in October um, in Chile, in Valparaiso, Chile. Uh, I believe that's going to be the site. And the details are kind of, you know, slowly being um, developed. We were um, very excited that the that they decided to continue with the same three primary themes that were put forward in the first. Um, oh, he wrote. So it's definitely 2015. October 2015 is when this Chilean conference was happening. Now the Hobart meeting, which is when the next Go On workshop will be, is May 2016. I just want to clarify that. But the the Chilean conference is, if it's anything like it, the State Department, our U.S. State Department conference was this past June, it tends to be, or, or was very focused so on... So we, we have a question level. from India from MMLE, which is uh, very basic and perhaps is something that will be talked about in this Chile conference, which is how do we curtail ocean acidity? It wasn't sort of open to anyone who wanted to go. I don't know how the Chilean one will transpire um, exactly, but we, but the folk, the three themes are ocean acidification, um, uh, marine pollution, and sustainable fisheries. So those were the same three that, that the U.S. our ocean conference focused on. Yes. <laughs> Well, I think we know that one of the primary, the primary driver is CO2 in the atmosphere. And so um, the sooner that we can uh, limit uh, CO2 emissions, the better. Uh, and uh, the Global OA Network, in addition, just sort of ocean acidification information in general, I think is going to factor fairly strongly in the um, Conference of the Parties meeting in Paris of the UN Framework on Climate Change coming up in uh, December 2015. So, you know, that's that is obviously the um, the overarching intent is to make sure that the information that we're learning about ocean acidification and its impacts is fed into those larger global factors. You didn't speak about it in this talk, but there's a, quite an interesting example from the Pacific Northwest of real-time ocean acidification monitoring and some real um, impacts on industry, on the, on the American industry. Is that a kind of a unique example, or is this something that can happen in other environments around the world where there's big variations in ocean? Also, you know, reducing 
emissions of acidic gases from our from our industries along the coast might be another. Well, for those of you in the know, the, the primary reason that we're seeing it along our U.S. West Coast is because that's an upwelling system, uh, and we know that there are many upwelling systems around the world. Unfortunately, we don't have as much information about how LA is playing out in those systems. However, um, we are getting indication, which is why it's um, uh, important that the meeting's happening in Chile. Um, Chile is also a coast that experiences upwelling conditions, and there's some indication that the shellfish industry, shellfish hatchery industry, in some of those in Chile are already experiencing problems that are related to corrosive waters. Um, and a, a whole other region, obviously, that's an upwelling system is along the west coast of Africa, which is one of our intents is to make to see if we can get more information about what's happening in Africa um, so that we can be providing them with information that might be related to their um, Marine resources. So you mentioned Africa, so let me take the question from Bjorn so Fielder, not, which is, uh, is there more information already about the African Capacity Building Workshop in Mozambique? And we'll starting in 2005 or so, um, and we've been able to bring it back, and we want to make sure um, that we're sharing that information with other regions that are potentially vulnerable in the near term um, by developing technologies that um, that other that other places can um, use. Yeah, so the intention is to not only train African partners, um, but provide them with um, the necessary equipment, you know, that they will need to do monitoring after we leave. So um, we don't necessarily have all of the funds in place in order to provide that equipment, but one of the intents is to try and leverage and raise that funding um, over the next, you know, five months or so. So if you're interested in participating in that, the Sam DuPont again from the um, University of Gothenburg is the lead. Um, however, there's that other workshop which is happening prior, I believe it's in November or December 2015 in South Africa, um, and uh, Lisa Robbins from... So there's um, a question about data, and general questions actually about data. To appear on the Go on map, do you have to share your data? Her contact information, she's actually um, spearheading that effort on behalf of the International Coordination Center. So I think between having those two activities, Mozambique and South Africa, we're trying to um, expand the network of um, people who have been trained and who can be contributing to the global OA effort. <laughs> That there's very strong um, push and understanding by the scientists that have come together for the Global OA Observing Network that um, access that access access to the data is key. That that to be to participate in this effort, the data must be publicly accessible. Now I know that some regions don't necessarily have data centers that are the clear go-to data centers for their data, um, we are more than ready or more than willing to provide information about data centers that would be willing to take data if, if you know, individual researchers can't provide that in an ongoing way. 
but yet, no. I mean, um, I don't know at this point, if we look at the map, because we're only beginning that data portal um, process, uh, whether, in fact, all of that data, of all of those uh, um, points and lines on the map, is publicly accessible right now. But the intent is that it's You mentioned the data portal and also um, the fact that there are other centers, if you don't have a, da a data uh, center in your country yeah, or locally, that are willing to accept you know, the data. With some how, how many understanding that you need some time to do the QAQC of the data um, and, and, and also to give PIs who spent a lot of time and effort to collect that data, um, give them time to to work up publications, but then after that point, it should be publicly accessible. Uh, there are there are many many data centers by observing platform and variable, and I imagine the same is true in the. Like biochemical space and even probably work in the biological space. But maybe I was, was going to ask whether for all of the, the variables that you've advocated for uh, in the different regions and open ocean and coastal areas, are there standards uh, for how to take that up? Is the World Data Center, perhaps? But Albert, do you know how many there are? I'm not a data person. <laughs> well, no, and that's why we need goose to be <laughs> to helping us develop the standards. I mean, I know that you all have um, held a couple meetings of your biology panel. You've been moving forward on your biogeochemical panels. You know, we, you've kind of seen the sum total of what we've come up with so far. So, you know, this is a work in progress. Um, and it, you know, clearly the biology is uh, trickier, trickier. Um, I think the well, let me just say that Goose relies on the expert community and it would be people and go on to help us develop those standards. And then what we can do is help to publish and promote them amongst the weeks of the book. For the standard parameters that are collected on the you know, large go ship transects, for instance, and, um, and sort of less clarity on uh, how we will develop these for biological parameters. but. But the intention is there, and I'm determined to make that happen. <laughs> and so, for instance, you no, know, I was going to say in our in that next meeting, and uh, that we'll have after the Hobart. You know, in, in Hobart in May 2016. And I found it um, interesting this analogy you had between climate quality data and weather quality data for OA in terms of being able to really say how OA is evolving over long periods of time versus being able to understand local and immediate OA dynamics. Is that community to understand what the next steps are to move that into that? Um, deliberative process that you all go through that's so important. All right, what's lovely? We'll definitely put that on the uh, on the list for further conversation and refining standards and, yeah, and best practice. I mean, uh, so we've actually run out of time. Um, there's a, there are a few uh, kind of specific outstanding questions, and Libby's email is on the screen on the upper left there. Libby Jewett at NOAA.gov. And I'd encourage you to ask her those questions by email if there's still any questions. And then I'll end by thanking, thanking Libby. Thank you very much for your time and for the effort you have uh, put into 
to make and go on a, a dynamic community. <laughs> and that will be it for this webinar today. Our next webinar is from uh, Bernadette Sloyan. It will be about Ghost Ship Repeat Hydrography. And the date and time will be announced via, via the Goose email list. You can sign up to our email list on our website. Thanks very much, Olivia.